and welcome back to Bumblebee, my globetrotting friends. Today we are touring the top 10 most powerful dynasties in history. Let's start with the more familiar names and faces, such as the Julio-Claudian dynasty, a lineage that includes the first five emperors of Rome. The first being Emperor Augustus Caesar, aka Octavian, who founded the Roman Principate. He's also the one who beefed with his adopted dad's biological heir, Mark Antony, for said kingdom, and it unloaded all that Cleopatra, them taking their lives, snakes and swords drama. Tiberius comes next though, and he was one of the greatest Roman generals, but he was largely absent from running the state, preferring to leave the heavy lifting to the powerful men around him while doing horrific things on the privacy of his island Capri. Then Caligula, whose dad was poisoned by Tiberius, was a famous nutcase emperor and considered by many to be mentally insane for allegedly declaring war on the god of the sea Poseidon, appointing his horse military positions and other overtly bizarre behavior. Then when Praetorian guards smoke Caligula and his family, they appoint Claudius, who was the first emperor born outside of Italy, who completed the Roman annexation of Britain. Lastly was Nero, who committed, well, a lot of crimes, and took his own life. And after the death of Nero, Rome fell into disarray, as he had borne no son and their lineage collapsed. If you watch our channel, you know their name is on everything. The Habsburg dynasty was a family originally from Switzerland. These guys spread their legs to spread their dynasty, and they had multiple holy Roman emperors. They were reigning in Austria for six centuries, and through marriages, they were able to put the Habsburgs into power in the following kingdoms, Burgundy, Spain, Bohemia, and Hungary. And thanks to the habit of <clears throat> keeping it in the family, most of these guys were nuts. For example, Roman Emperor Leopold I loved to torture and the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolph was less interested in ruling than he was into turning himself into a wizard. Lest we forget the worst attempted peace treaty in history, after allying with their Austro-Hungarian Empire with Germany in World War I, the new Emperor Karl I secretly contacted France to secure a peace treaty, so his empire may not be divided after the war. This led the French Prime Minister to realize the Austro-Hungarians must be so weak that their armies would soon collapse, but rather than respond to Karl, he published his letter publicly destroying the last traces of morale in the empire. The line of dynasty that ruled the imperial Spain and its colonies in the new world came to an abrupt end when Carlos II turned out to be a genetic basket case as a result of his family's intimate mixing. But there's like 90 more family members I could go through and I got other stuff to do, so we're on to the next. A country known for the power of its dynasties gives us the Hans. When you google the 10 most powerful dynasties in history, 8 out of the 10 results are dynasties of China. It is the first truly powerful family in China after the Qin, whose massive wars of conquest and vast construction projects killed almost half the population. Peasant Liu Bang is the lead of an army that ended the empire and began the Hans in 202 BC. The Han Empire had the longest duration of any empire, 2100 years of imperial rule, even when interrupted by a coup and split into two halves. They really shaped the economy and the culture of China more than any other lineage. They created institutions and economic policies. Its economy was more efficient than most empires at the time. The Han major export was silk and they imported horses and glassware and precious metals, dominating the Silk Road. This was also the dynasty that brought paper to the world. Like most great empires, it started slipping after a few years. In the last decades, two emperors named Emperor Huan and Emperor Ling lived decadent lives. Slaying and fighting between rivals for power were common all over the empire, and as a result, a series of coups and revolts, the Han Empire quickly broke down as a series of warlords fought each other for control. One, Kakao, he had possession of the young Emperor Zhan and tried to unify by China, but ultimately failed. After Kakao died in 2020 CE, the Emperor Xian was forced to give up his position, officially ending the Han Dynasty. Another famous name is the Capetian family. The House of Capet, as it's called, ruled France from 987 to 1328 as the senior most line of the Capetian Dynasty. Hugh Capet, a king of France, starts what's the longest running father to son succession line in history today. An impressive 13 generations, spanning 330 years. The family itself already one of the oldest and largest royal houses in the world, repping names like the Windsors and the Habsburgs in their family, and the two Capetian monarchs are still running Spain and Luxembourg to this day. In total, their family has 38 French kings, 12 kings of Navarre, and 11 kings of Naples, 10 kings of Spain, and 9 kings of Portugal. Seeing as these guys are still going, I can't really say, oh well, this is when the last one died, now can I? Just gotta wait them out. Kidding. Or am I? Next! We all know about the spread of the Khans, but what about the Mongol dynasty? 
dynasty itself, obviously founded by Genghis. The Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous empire of all history. This man raised his way across Asia, well into the Ottoman Empire and the Egyptian lands, but never quite making it to full-blown all areas of Europe. Khan's descendants inherited and expanded his empire. It lasted for hundreds of years, and appeared they were the most powerful family in the world, as everyone feared the day they might show up at their door. The Mongols invaded in every direction, and most armies couldn't stand up to them at the time. They managed to create the Pax Monacalia, which allowed for trade, technology, and ideas to travel and flourish across Eurasia. This lineage was more powerful than all other dynasties at the time, but also notoriously more accepting of ethnic and religious differences. Just so long as you submit and follow our pretty chill laws, you could exist in peace. The dynasty lasted for 479 years, starting with Genghis Khan in 1206 and ending with the collapse of the Chattagi Khanate in 1687. Because old is in the name, Oldenburg Dynasty, which began in ancient times, so they should probably rename it to Ancientburg. Apparently, this lineage comes from the god Odin, according to myth, then more realistically, the king of Jutes, and then the Saxons down to Wiccagain, and the last king of the Saxons in 800 AD. After that, the house gets its name through Wiccandun's eventual descendant, Elamar I, Count of Oldenburg, who lived in the 12th century. His descendants reign over present-day Denmark and Norway, and until the 1970s, they also ruled Greece. Prince Philip of Great Britain, the son of Prince Andrew of Greece, was a member of the House of Oldenburg, and this dynasty now rules the UK and its Commonwealth realms too, under his son Prince Charles and any of his heirs and successors. They're back for more. This time, it's the Chinese dynasty, the Tangs. The Tang Dynasty of China represents something of a golden age in the imperial Chinese history. Characterized by proliferation of the art, economic development, and territorial expansion into Central Asia, it's remembered as one of the most prosperous and culturally influential eras in Chinese history. The Tang Dynasty's capital of Chang was one of the largest empires in world history. Controlling from Eurasia to Korea in the east to Afghanistan in the west, the Tang encouraged any and all people with talent, whatever their background and ethnicity, to come to Ang and participate as working citizens. In the 7th century, the Tang Dynasty introduced the Tang Code, a revised penal system governing China's laws and punishments. It was a complex code informed by Confucian principles and rationalism. With it, the Tang court abolished certain forms of cruel corporal punishment, preserving death for only extremes. There were three key departments of the civil service, along with six ministries managing revenue, rights, personnel, defense, justice, and infrastructure. And fun fact, Liyuan, who started as a commander of the tyrannical Su Empire, turned around to revolt with the help of his daughter. She led an army of 70,000 and captured the cities before joining her father at Chang, one of the few female generals in history, let alone China's history. The two of them created the Tang Dynasty. This was also the only dynasty to have a female emperor, Wu Zetan, and under her reign, the army successfully conquered Central Asia and added much more territory to the empire. A dynasty that ruled the Russian territories for over 700 years, the Ruriks. The Rurik dynasty gets its name from the Viking chieftain named Rurik, who, who in 862 AD founded the town Novigorodin, one day to be Kievan Rus. Rurik was succeeded by his young son Igor, who was too young to rule, so Rurik's kinsman Oleg ruled until Igor came of age. Igor ruled a short while before being killed, but at his young age, he'd already produced an heir, Sviatoslav. Svia waged war for most of his rule. After his early death, his three sons duke it out with each other, and one survives to be king, Vladimir the Great, who consolidated the state of Kievan Rus to include modern day Baltic Sea region, including Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Vladimir's son, Yaroslav the Wise, brought the state to its zenith in culture and military importance and laid the foundation for the crucial code of law for the state. However, after his death, the Rurik dynasty split into three princely cadet branches, the heads of each styling themselves as grand princes. From that point on, Kivan Ruz was essentially a loosely formed state, and the Rurik dynasty broke up into sub dynasties, each one ruling a distinct principality, claiming to the descent of Rurik the Old. And just as it often happens with large and successful ruling dynasties, the line of Rurik becomes hazy and muddled after a while. With the formation of principles and sub branches, the family tree of the Rurik's grew complex and vast. Nevertheless, the Rurik dynasty would remain in power until 1610 AD, boasting a total of 21 male line generations. We can't talk about the most powerful dynasties without bringing up the longest one, the Imperial House of Japan. According to historical chronicles in ancient Japan, the Kojuki and the Nihon Shoki, the sun goddess, Amaras Tuomikami presented imperial regalia to her grandson, Nagini no Mikoto. He in return passed them on to his descendants, the emperors, the first of whom was Emperor Jimu in 660 BC. After Emperor Jimu, there was a succession of sons that inherited the title 
title from their fathers. But very little is known about most of them until Emperor Sujin, who was on the throne from 97 BC to 30 BC. And this emperor was the first to have more serious administration of the country by having a census and improving tax systems. Some emperors that came after him didn't have any children like the 22nd emperor. In this case, the emperor would name sons or grandsons of brothers or uncles as heirs so the lineage would continue. The emperor was thought to possess magical powers, therefore considered beneath him to be involved in the day-to-day -day running of the country. This was left to the ministers and advisors until Emperor Tenji, then followed by Prince Shotoku of the Nara period, creating the first constitution. From the moment Japan became more organized in the 6th century, the imperial family and court have played important roles in Japanese politics. A period of unrest started with the law of the sword above anything else, and this violent period only ended in the Tokugawa clan, establishing a new shogunate in the Edo in the early 17th century. As the name implies, the Meiji Restoration was a time during which the emperor was restored to his former glory. Japan started branching out quickly to catch up with the West and protect its interests in the region and it's modernized its industries. And ending us off today is the Medici dynasty. Famously the wealthiest family of Europe, they controlled Florence and made it prosper, funding its arts and development. They were bankers by trades, benevolent to sports by design, and cultural influencers. The family produced three popes, two queens, and many Florentine rulers, ruling from the 13th into the 17th century. The Medici family commissioned virtually all of Florence's breathtaking art and architecture, works by Bruccielli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Donatello, Fra Angelico. Giovanni de Medici is the first Medici, a rags to riches type, working his ass off and also marrying above his social class, so he used that dowry given to make a risky investment in textiles. Pays off, and so he started the Medici Bank. By 1420, he's the wealthiest man in Florence, using it to kick off Florence's prominence in the arts during the early Renaissance period. His firstborn son, Cosimo, ruled Florence from his workshop behind the scenes, passing a yay or a nay on proposed government laws from his study. Over 37 years, Cosimo created a dynasty that would endure centuries and produced four popes, one of them his own kids. The last Medici, Anna Maria de Luisa de Medici, died in 1743. The Medici line was then extinct, but the legacy of the family lived on. Anna bequeathed the Medici treasures, the family's entire artistic patronomy, to the people of Florence. The only condition is that none of it can be sold or gifted to other countries. Thank God, because we know the Museum of Stolen Items, oh, my bad, I mean the Royal British Museum, would have taken those in a second. All right, all right, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more of our content and comment down below what family you really think was the most powerful. Peace.